please welcome Dr. Lanny Bell. Okay, let's, oh, it's working. I can tell it's working. Yes, okay. So, Caroline, you did stumble over Oriental Institute, and that's not surprising because when I was there, we called it the Old Mental Institute. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to write down what time I start because that's a good clue to me is when I should stop. It's better that you say, why didn't he go on rather than why didn't he stop 10 minutes ago? And I, I would like to read only one thing to you. Otherwise, it's uh, based on memory. And that's uh, basically an abstract of what you're going to see tonight, and so you'll be looking for it. It's just a few sentences long. An examination of the way the ancient Egyptians faced the all too familiar problem of death reveals that rather than being obsessed with death, they were obsessed with life. They were reconciled to death as a natural process. Life is a terminal condition. They enjoyed their earthly existence, comfortable with being both in and of the world. There was no body-soul dichotomy of the sort that decrees everything involving the physical is evil, while everything associated with the spirit is good. They were really quite balanced. They were complete beings only with, when body and soul were united in them. At the same time, they looked forward to an eternal existence based on this model. Death was the portal to rebirth into a new kind of life. The lecture presents Egyptians' preparations for death, revealing their attitudes toward death and the dead in terms of the association of three fundamental characteristics of ancient Egyptian culture, pyramids, mummies, and works of art deposited in gra as grave goods. The material presented ranges primarily from the time of the Old Kingdom, starting in 2700 BC, through the New Kingdom, ending at 1070 BC, so it's a wide range, and, and the New Kingdom was an era of highly developed theological speculation. I'm going to give you a few insights into that as we go along. Okay, you have the topic here. You see me. Let's see, let's see what we can do. This is one of the three features that we're going to be examining. It's, of course, the great pyramids at Giza on a beautiful um, uh, cloudy day. So the pyramids stand out uh, very well. So why did the Egyptians build pyramids? What does that mean? This is the mummy of Ramses II, uh, who lived to be 84 to 90, somewhere in there. He reigned for 67 years, so he was no spring chicken when he died. And so why did the Egyptians pres preserve their bodies in, in this way? The Egyptians never, throughout their whole history, would uh, uh, cremate a body. The only exception to your having to have your body was if you drowned in the Nile, and they couldn't find your body because it washed out to sea or because the animals or the fish had eaten it, you could associate yourself with Osiris, who, according to one of the Osiris myths, also drowned. And so if you drown, you become an Osiris, and you go right to the netherworld. And then they put these wonderful uh, museum-worthy uh, objects of art uh, in their tombs as well. They, they, they sometimes prepare these, these monuments just for the tomb. And so they want to have them with them in the other world, and we want to know why. It may be this uh, a plastic sculpture here, or it might be these wonderful tomb paintings, this one from the New Kingdom at Thebes, which shows what we describe in our own terminology as uh, uh, actions of daily life. But for the Egyptians, it meant something entirely different. It's not just something nice to look at. It actually means whatever I depict is going to happen in the next world. So the simplest burial is, of course, a hole in the ground with the body flexed in, the, in this uh, position with the knees drawn up. And that has a practical reason and a symbolic reason. The practical reason is that if you're going to bury somebody and you fold them up like this, you don't have to build such a long burial chamber. So right, put them in there. And then the, the Egyptians also were very aware of the position of the fetus in the womb. And you think, how could the Egyptians possibly know something as sophisticated as that? Remember, they were making mummies. They had to take bodies apart. They studied the anatomy while they were doing it. And they wrote very extensive anatomical treatises 
uh, one of the most important ones is the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus. So the doctor comes and examines you, says, I think I can treat you, or you're too bad. But, and, and, and then they go on to describe what, what the doctor should do. So these bodies are nothing but skeletons now. And uh, they were buried with artifacts. You see pottery and uh, other little things in there with them. Those uh, numbers are German, but still. And then they quickly went from the hole in the ground to the built-up monument, made of mud brick. In the beginning of, of time, the Egyptians thought that God had told them to build in Nile mud and with reeds, and so they, they did that. And they, even as they made monuments uh, cut in the mountain or built up, they pretended that they were still building with mud and reeds so as not to offend God. So here we have two examples of tombs from the period of about 31,000 BC, so 5,000 years ago, roughly. There's no exam, so 5,000 years ago. They're two different types, but they have much more in common than they have different. So the upper one is rather a simple thing. And the lower one is rather a more elaborate one. The upper one is the more important, in fact, because of its, of its ritual history. The lower one is used by people who served the pharaoh. So the pharaoh's tomb in the first and second dynasty looks like that. And his retainers and family members and so forth, their burials look like, like this. The lower one, with the niches and pseudo doorways and so forth, represents a house. It, it's, a, it's a noble's house. So this is the house of the dead that they're symbolizing. And both of them have the same feature inside this very elaborate uh, facade. There is a mound of sand and earth. You can see it very clearly in the primitive one from Abydos and from Saqqara, this is a more sophisticated one. And they make a mound of earth over the burial. And so they're putting the burial in the ground at the bottom of a shaft, a rock, a rock cut shaft. And then they're putting a mound on top of it. And so the features they have in common besides the mound are the enclosure wall around the monument itself with subsidiary graves of servants uh, who uh, went to the afterworld uh, with, the, with the owner of the, of the tomb, whether he be king or noble. Now, that's, that turned out to be a very bad habit. and It became difficult to find servants. And so <laughs> they, they made a way around this. You didn't have to do it. And, uh, and husband and wife, who, I mean, of course it would be the wife, whichever, whichever one died first, didn't have to be killed at the time that the, that the other one died. So the Egyptians were, became quite humane after a brief experience with the slaughtering uh, servants at the, at the time of the burial. And every one of these monuments has a place where offerings can be made. There are two stelae, two round top slabs of stone, and an altar in the middle. It doesn't show here. Now you can see inside that more complicated structure from, uh, from uh, Saqqara, which is up where the step pyramid is. And you look down through the sand mound. So this is just a retaining wall, which is, making, which is holding the, the mound in some kind of position so it doesn't just get blown away by the winds. And you look down through the sand, and you can find the, the brick, originally brick, and then later stone uh, structures which represent the place that the coffin could be placed and the burial goods could be placed. And then the, the, the area was filled up with sand and you have this mound. Now why a mound? The Egyptian, before the building of the Aswan High Dam, the completion of the High Dam in the night, about 1964, the Nile would flood every year pretty regularly, uh, starting in the south in, in July and uh, uh, res resuming its banks about September. And this happened annually. So every year, the Egyptians saw the agricultural land completely flooded. Their little villages were built on turtlebacks, on little mounds, so that the, except in an extraordinarily high Nile, you wouldn't have to rebuild your village every year. And that the goal was not to do that. So you have, you have a bad Nile when it's, when it's too much or too little. If it's too little, you have famine. If it's, if it's uh, too, too high, you lose your, your house. So uh, they saw this every year. And of course, the highest things that had been flooded to emerge first were the little mounds. So they saw the world completely flooded. Think of Genesis, the, the waters, uh, the, uh, the abyssal waters flooding and then the earth appearing from it. And then so this dried out. A bird came and landed on it. 
had eggs, uh, uh, weeds started growing, or, or grain, or whatever. So they wanted, they said, gee, this is the way the world works, so why don't we create a little model of it for ourselves, so we will be able to be resurrected just the way the Earth is resurrected. So in the uh, Old Kingdom, you have mastabatums, they're called. It's a, it's a jargon word in Egyptology. It's an Arabic word for bench, because in the late 19th century, when the French were excavating in Egypt with local workers, the Arab speakers said, gee, this looks just like the benches, the mastabas, which are around the courtyard of our houses. So that it, we, we got to have that wonderful jargon word there. So here's the structure again. Here's the offering shack. It has, it's built of stone this time. It has two rectangular openings, which are the opening for the shafts, his and hers. They don't have to go in at the same time. Leading in the burial shaft down to the burial chamber, where the body is laid in the coffin and offerings are placed beside. So the earliest uh, burials were close to the ground, to, 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 to the surface of the ground. And, the, lower, and, and the, the later burials became more sophisticated. There was a disadvantage to that. Now, this, these are mastabas. At Giza, I'm, I'm standing, I, I stole the, the photograph from National Geographic, I'm standing on top of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and I'm looking at a city of the dead, with the houses here, the mastabas, with the streets in between them. So, uh, these, the, the ones closest to the, to the pyramid, remember I'm on the pyramid here, are those of his sons who pre he predeceased him. So, the size is important. And so the, the, the ones that got to be, that were closer to him in life got to be closer to him in death because only the king at this time had the divine right to be resurrected. And they thought maybe if you, if you can go up on the coattails of the king as he's going up to, 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 to join the, the, the sun and the stars, then you'll be all right. Each of, those, each of them have these two little uh, 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 openings at the top. And a little bit later, somebody comes along and builds a little shack a shack tomb across one of these streets. So we, we, we have a slum here. And think of these as Levitt towns. Some of you know what that means. Levitt towns are towns that were mass produced and then when people bought it, they just moved into it. Well, some of these mastabas, most of these mastabas were made in anticipation of someone dying and needing to have a tomb. And they left out the crucial slab inside that had the, the name of the person who owned it. So that as you died, you got to have your own, your own setting. Now, in the 1970s, a British expedition north of the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara excavated the area of the tombs of the nobles of the first dynasty. And this is the foundation of one of them. This was buried originally, and the rectangular structure was up on top. So this is the substructure, not the rectangular superstructure on top. And they tried to make it solid. They, this is a foundation that they're giving for it. They tried to make it solid. And so they made this platform, which turns out to be little steps. Well, this is, of course, a prototype for the Steppe Pyramid, which happened uh, two dynasties later, at the beginning of, of, of the third dynasty. So it's not surprising that the next step is that the Egyptians experiment under the brilliant architect, the first architect in history, in fact, uh, uh, named him Hotep that he starts building with, with, with blocks of stone. But because the Egyptians are supposed to have been told by God to build in mud, he was a little timid about this. He, he didn't, he'd had no idea if stone was going to be as good as brick had been always and, and wouldn't irritate God. And so the, bricks that he, the, the stones that he used are just large, large brick size. So he kept to the tradition until very quickly they uh, learned that that this would work, and they went to three tons and eventually to 30 ton blocks uh, within, within 100 years. So this started out as a mastaba. You can just basically pick out the, uh, uh, that flat rectangular shape here, trapezoidal shape. And then the architect decided, well, the king's still around, I'm still around, so we'll expand it, we'll make a bigger one, and then why not, why not add more and more steps on top? This, uh, uh, this uh, step pyramid was never made into a smooth side pyramid. It always had steps all the way up. And the hieroglyph for uh, ancient tomb or ancient pyramid, the most ancient pyramid, is in fact a step pyramid. All right. Now, so this allows the dead to go up on a ladder. The Egyptians use this image. They go up, they can go up on a ladder to heaven. So these are the steps by which you can make your way to heaven. So time went on. This is, this is the second pyramid. This was built by the uh, 
uh, father of the first ruler of the fourth dynasty, who is uh, Khufu, or Cheops, who built the Great Pyramid. So Snefru actually had three pyramids. And uh, this one is built at a site called Maidom. It's south of Giza. He didn't, he didn't build at Giza at this point. And it represents a great block of stone, which was actually in steps underneath this. They filled in the steps. And then they actually, they probably, it's hard to tell since these are the stones of the, of, of the, of the uh, surface that are there. It probably was turned into a smooth-sided uh, pointed pyramid. It's probably the first one. Well, this is the disaster at Maidum. Because at some time during its construction, it started to collapse. And so they abandoned it and went to another site to, 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 uh, to adjust a tomb that they were building at the same time. All right. So uh, Snefru was never buried here. Nobody was buried here. But it became a cult place for Snefru so that they, they built a little chapel to him so they, they, people could come and worship their, their, their god king here. This is, this is the, the pyramid that follows on immediately after that. This one was under construction at the time the structural problem happened. The, 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 the blocks didn't uh, fall down all in that time because we have, we have graffiti inside the offering chapel that go much later than this. So it was about the new kingdom that finally this collapsed. But there was a structural problem. So when they discovered the structural problem, some messenger was sent rushing across the desert 10 kilometers to, to, to the site of, of, of Dashur. And they said, stop, because you're going to have a disaster. So they paid attention. They, they saw the problem. And so they made a change here. So this is where the, the angle that they were building, much too steep. And this is the angle that they finally decided on for stability. This angle happens to be the angle of repose. It's the most uh, structurally sound architectural uh, form in the world. If you go to the beach and take a, a handful of sand and let it dribble down on the beach, it'll make a little conical uh, shape of, uh, of, of exactly this, this, uh, this form. So because of this imperfection, uh, uh, Zephyr wasn't buried here either. So uh, a couple of things that they forgot along the way, because they were learning. This, these are the first two pyramids in the world. And, and, and the step pyramid is the first monumental stone architectural building in the world. We're not talking stone hinges, but we're talking actually built, built monuments. They forgot that you need a foundation. They never learned that lesson. I, uh, many people ask if the Martians were helping the Egyptians build the pyramids. I say, well, if the Martians were helping, they didn't know a damn thing about building pyramids either because they didn't tell them about foundations. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, Snefru made a perfect pyramid at Dashur which we, we can visit today. It's called the Red Pyramid. And it is the predecessor of the Great Pyramid of Giza done by his son. So this is his son. This is uh, 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 Khufu. This is uh, Khafre. This is his son. And then this is, this is a, a later uh, member of the, of the dynasty. There was, there was a, a, a brother of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, Kefren who went to another site to, 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 to build for himself. So you're looking now, there's, the, there's the, the Mastaba field that I showed you, the tombs of, of the subsidiary uh, people. We're up on the Giza Plateau. You can look down in the Nile Valley. The Nile is back here in the, in the background. There are structures around the pyramids. This, this is a, um, a museum housing a 120-foot uh, Cedar of Lebanon boat, uh, which was found in 1954. In a, in a pit when they were cleaning uh, around the pyramid, they said, oh, there's a lid here. So we picked it off, and there was, there was the boat. It was a boat kit. It was in pieces. It took 25 years to figure out how to put it back together. But, but it's successfully done. And uh, the original facing stone, the casing stone, of the tip of the pyramid is up here. This is the only one where the casing stone has, has, has survived at the top. You might think that as, as there, and, and these stones were torn down in the Middle Ages to build Cairo. It's cheaper than, than going to the quarries. And nobody cared about pyramids anymore. And so you, you think that as, as they're pulling the, the stones off from the bottom up, of course, that the whole thing ought to collapse. But it doesn't, because the back of the casing stones is stepped so that it fits right into and rests upon the stone. So it's not, it's not bearing, uh, the, the, the lower stuff is not bearing the weight of all this coming cr crushing down on it. 
Now, pyramids are not glorious monuments standing in the middle of nowhere. This is, this is a pyramid at Abu Sir, where my tours go now, and it's of the fifth dynasty, and it shows the pyramid. It shows that there was a, a pyramidian, a small pyramid up on top, which uh, was, was cased in, in, in sheet gold or, or in, in, in bronze somehow, so that as the rising sun coming from over here, the Niles down here, coming from here, would hit the peak first, and it would seem that the rays of the sun were descending from the sides and the corners of the pyramids. And the pyramid is definitely a solar symbol. So in addition to a staircase climbing up to heaven, this also represents the sun in the sky, God in fact, with the rays of the sun coming down to the four uh, corners of the flat earth, which the Egyptians uh, uh, had conceived. So there is a, a temple up here dedicated to the cult of the king, and then there's a causeway, a, a, a covered walkway, ceremonial walkway, going down to the river. The uh, color of the ground is, is, is changed over here because the, uh, the German architect didn't wish to have to stretch this out and just waste paper, so he said, all right, it starts here and it continues down here, so that's what this is all about. Then it goes down to the valley temple, we're not quite sure what happened in the Valley Temple. There's another Valley Temple over there. The, the architects gave us a sample of Mastaba. This is the Queen's Pyramid. So this is what a pyramid's like. It de it's, it, it's definitely not a beacon for summoning spaceships. Okay. <laughs> the pyramid form did not cease to be used, and it was used only by royalty, did not cease to be used after the uh, great uh, construction of the Fourth Dynasty Pyramids. Uh, after the fourth dynasty, the pharaoh was not for a long time again ever as holy and, and, and uh, unquestionable and absolute as he was. They ran out of money. And so they, in the Middle Kingdom, they made mud brick pyramids, and then they faced them with this wonderful limestone that came from the quarry of Tura very near Cairo. And once the casing stones are taken off again for reuse someplace else, it's, it's recycling, then you get just the mud brick core underneath. So that's not the way the pyramid looked in the time of this Middle Kingdom uh, ruler, Amenemhat III. But that's the way it looks now. And now because of the Aswan High Dam and the 300-mile lake to the south of, lake, of, of, of Aswan, the, the Aswan High Dam, you get much more rain than you ever got before in Egypt. In Egypt, it used to rain maybe one time a century. And the Egyptians write about rushing out to see the waters coming from heaven. They couldn't believe it and the cascades that were coming off the mountains in Thebes. But now it's, it's much more common thing, so they're disintegrating rapidly. Well, these pyramids continued down to the time of the beginning of the 18th dynasty, so down to uh, 1550 BC or so, and then they were abandoned by the kings. The, most of the pyramids by this time had already been robbed, and so the Egyptian king said, we've got to do something different. This, this isn't working. I mean, building a pyramid is a dead giveaway. You say, okay, come here, doot, 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 come here, all right? All right, so they then transferred the royal tombs to the valley of what we know as the Valley of the Kings. It was a, uh, a wadi and a royal, which in fact the, the Egyptians opened up the bottom end of it in order to, to have the, uh, the funeral ceremonies go on along the way when someone had to be buried. And it's that, that's the tomb of Ramses VI, which is, which is what hid the tomb of Tutankhamun down here, so Howard Carter uh, could be the one who discovered it, because all the debris that came out of the construction of this big 20th dynasty tomb came down across the, the, the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun's memory was being suppressed because he uh, was too tightly associated with the, the heretic period of Akhenaten, and so it, it was there waiting for Carter. And on top of all of these tombs in there, there are now 64 tombs, all 60, in the top of the tombs, there is a mountain pyramid. So you no longer have to build a minuscule little pyramid like that. This is 1,500 feet high. This is the pyramid that, that serves for all the burials which are underneath it. But it's a natural pyramid. It's a holy mountain. When the kings moved to the Valley of the Kings, then the nobility were able to use the pyramid form. It was a royal prerogative until the, until the king gave it up, and then the important people of the realm who could afford it were, were making them as well. This, uh, these are some tombs that I, I was uh, responsible for for the University of Pennsylvania Theban uh, Tomb Project. For scale, 
here's the a local inhabitant of the house. The houses of, I, I bought the houses, and, and then they've all been torn down now so that excavation can proceed underneath them. And up on top of the hill is built into the, the, the uh, mountain itself, just uh, faced so you don't have to clear a platform. They made a mud brick pyramid. And you can tell by the scale that you can actually walk into this. There's a little offering chamber in there. And it was all painted, it was all plastered and then painted white, so it would glisten and there would be a pyramid stone up on top as well. So this, this is what people were able to do. And these, these are, this, my site, is the largest pyramids that were ever built by private individuals uh, in the Theban area. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to replicate for their tombs the holy mountain. And so th this is the, the, the chunk of, of the pyramid. And you can see that uh, it, it has been plastered, and of course it was originally painted, that they had on top of their monuments. Now these pyramid tombs are represented for us, conveniently, by the uh, people who were buried in the, in the Theban tombs during the New Kingdom. So they show the Theban mountain running down with ceremonies at the time of burial, uh, uh, prayers and may offerings and uh, a ritual called the opening of the mouth where you, you allow the dead person to, to, to speak and to, and to breathe and to hear and, and to see and so forth uh, ritually. And then they have the entrance to the tomb, which is a wooden door. And on top of that, you have a, a reference to the sun. And then there's the pyramid up on top with the pyramid and, and a little niche for putting a, uh, a statue of some kind. So they show us just what these tombs were like. Now, in the 1970s, late 1970s, the French mission working on the west bank of the Nile at Luxor in a, in a village called Daryl Medina, which is the village of the craftsmen who, who excavated and decorated the tombs in the Valley of the Kings throughout the New Kingdom. They decided that they would reconstruct a pyramid across the foundations of the original New Kingdom pyramid so that you would have an impression of what the site was actually like. So they, they built this, this pyramid to show you. And these are the remains of tombs and so forth over here. The National Geographic in the post-war period, post, my, my post-war, the post-World post War II period, did a wonderful series where they showed life in ancient times. And Egypt, of course, was, was one of the things that they showed. And so they show a tomb at Dar el Medina, this artisan's workshop, where they've combined everything together in Western perspective to give you a clearer idea of what's going on. So here's the pyramid tomb with the pyramidian with the little stele in there. This is the entrance to the tomb. This is the place that you're going to place the dead. So first you have to stand him up and do this, this funeral ritual. These are the mourning women, the, the, the members of the, of the family, and sometimes professional mourners as well. And here are the workmen who are standing by, ready to close it. So they've got everything in here. And these are the things that are coming up to the tomb, as well as these mysterious ritual dances, which date back to 2000 BC. Again, just to help you visualize what's going on. Then our colleagues up at, uh, at the French mission in Karnak uh, made a, uh, a, a sketch of the way that the pyramid uh, cemetery would have looked had, of course, you have to imagine, that nothing decayed and, had, and, and, and fell down. They, they just show us at one time, the, the, this is the way they would like it to have been seen. The Egyptians would like it to have been seen, but of course, it, that's not human. That's not possible. Now, the pyramid doesn't even die uh, when we get to the Roman period. These are pyramids, royal pyramids, belonging to kings and queens, uh, at uh, various sites in Egypt, in the, in, uh, in the Sudan, the continuation to the south of Egypt, up the Nile. This is the site of Meroe, which was an important burial place for rulers at one time. And the Sudanese Antiquities Department uh, made a reconstruction here using the standing monument and filling it in and showing the, the, the pylon gateway that they have and so forth. And then up at the top, there's some different conception. It, the, the, the top of the pyramid doesn't end in a point, so I don't, I'm not quite sure what the Sudanese are doing. And here's another pyramid that they built from whole cloth o over the foundations of the ancient one. And then another site, Gebel Barco in the Sudan, where you get these, this field of, of, uh, of royal pyramids. Now, these pyramids look much more like the pyramids of the nobles in the Theban area, they were also in the Memphite area, rather than, of course, the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, remember the Romans conquered Egypt. Remember uh, uh, Octavian, uh, Augustus, and Antony and Cleopatra, 
and Bernard Shaw and all these kind of things. Uh, the, a, man, a man called uh, Gaius Cestius was a, an agent for Augustus after 30 BC, after the Battle of Actium, after the death of Cleopatra and uh, um, Antony. And uh, Gaius Cestius spent some time in Egypt. We don't know what he was doing exactly. But when he came back, he decided, I'm going to make myself a pyramid. So he carried the pyramid to Rome. And this uh, um, pyramid is still standing. It's in Rome. It's on the, it's ahead of the Austrian Way here, coming out the uh, Porta San Paolo. And there's apparently a bus stop nearby. So if you've been to Rome and you're trying to go to Austria, you may have stopped at the bus stop. But whether you notice the pyramid or not is another thing. The, the, the pyramid is made of Roman concrete overlain with slabs of marble. And there it is. He has a little plaque around the side here which says who he is and what he did. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't know what this was. So Rome got the pyramid. There was, with, with Caesar, with Augustus Caesar's conquest of Egypt, there was a period of Egyptomania. And we get Egyptomania periods every now and then. For instance, when Tutankhamun's tomb, Egypt was discovered, Egypt was all the rage. Uh, whenever something important happens in the world, then people go back to Egyptology. So the Romans were the first ones who liked to copy the, the power of the pharaohs and so forth and take it back to Rome as a kind of a, of a, a monument to their, to their own strength. This is the earliest American pyramid. <laughs> it's from, it's from, uh, it's from um, uh, Phoenix. It's up on top of a little hill where there's something called the Papago Park. And so you walk up and you find the burial place of George P. Hunt. And he was the first governor of the state of Arizona. And he and, and uh, 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 I forget if he was Democrat or Republican. Anyway, they, they, they switched with each other. Every, every, you know, every, every year someone gets elected and then they do a bad job and someone else comes in. So these guys rotated up until, up until 1933. So George P. Hunt was, was the, the, the first, the third, the fifth, you know, that kind of stuff, governor, <laughs> governor of Arizona. And his wife's family is actually buried there. And he, of course, was allowed to join them. And they had been to Egypt, so they also thought that e Egypt and the pyramids was, was a great thing. This is the most recent American pyramid. <laughs> and uh, a, a famous Egyptologist, Mark Lehner, who works in the Giza area and is a specialist on the Sphinx, acted as consultant for the company that wanted to do this. And Mark had to take a year off from teaching because he made more money consulting than they were paying him as a, as a, as a professor. So he, he, had, he had to not take a salary. And so here's, his, here's his, his conception of the Sphinx and the conception of the Great Pyramid. Now this to me is very important because since the casing stones are gone from the Great Pyramid and we don't know what was written on the outside, now we have an idea. <laughs> In actuality, of course, in actuality, of course, there was nothing written on the outside of the pyramid. The, the decoration uh, was in the temples that, that were associated with the pyramid. And even the pyramid texts were not written inside pyramids until the end of the fifth dynasty. Anyway, when I went to lecture at, uh, at Las Vegas, I didn't go there to, to play. I didn't even go inside, perish the thought. But uh, I, I, had, I had to go take a picture of, of, the, of, of the Great Pyramid and the, and the Sphinx. And the Avenue of Sphinx is from Karnak as well. So America also has the pyramid in the Great Seal, which appears still in, on our dollar bill, worthless though it seems to be sometimes. And this is the Eye of God. That's the, that's the pyramid up on top. This is all due to the Freemasonry of our founding fathers. They incorporated all kinds of Egyptian ideas, particularly since they were Masons and the Egyptians were such great builders, they regarded them as their, as their ancestors. So this is the, the new order of the world with the Great Pyramid there. And the Egyptians imagined also that in, in the pyramid stone was, was the, 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 the god himself because we have Egyptian pyramidia that have a, a divine eyes on them as well. So at the top of every obelisk, which is a, uh, a Greek term, uh, which means a, uh, uh, a rod which is a spit. So if, if, if you want to charbroil something, you put it on a spit. And so they said that, that, this, was, that this looked like a big spit. And per, uh, uh, obelisks have to be monolithic for the ancient Egyptians, monumental ones. They have to be made of a single extracted colossal block of red granite from Aswan. 
And up in the top of them, you have a little pyramidion. The Egyptian name for the, for the obelisk is poker or, or piercer because they saw it as kind of like the, 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 uh, the axis, axis of the world tree. It penetrates from the earth to the sky and gives us access to God. It has many more symbolic uh, representations. I wrote an article about it, but you won't get that now. Anyway, this one is in Central Park, out behind the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was recovered from uh, Alexandria. It and its uh, uh, coal obelisk are in the Central Park and on the Thames in London. They were gifts by the Egyptian government to America and Britain. This is the biggest obelisk in the world, but it's a fake obelisk, of course, because it's not monolithic. This is the Washington Monument. Built of, it's built up of blocks by the Masons again. And so uh, this is the way the Egyptians would like to have, to, to have seen it. They never saw it, of course, but they'd like to have seen it this way. And this, this is because they imagined that the, the sun was radiating from it. Because in, in the particular granite that they have, there's a lot of, of quartz, and it looks, it looks like sparkle and so forth. And once in a while, the Egyptians knew that gold was associated with, uh, with, with quartz, and so it became a symbolic thing for them. And, we wind up in my little cemetery in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, where we have, in a very brief period, uh, the last third, perhaps, of the uh, 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 19th century and the first decade or so of the, of the 20th century, where important people had obelisks made to be put over the graves of their deceased ones. I, they weren't all masons, but I think the idea of this being a resurrection symbol, the, the rising of the sun and so forth, and piercing the heaven uh, actually was uh, on their mind. But they're very reticent about saying it. I've been, I've been going to cemeteries for years looking for some symbol that might tell me what they thought they were doing. And the best one that I found in a, in a little cemetery uh, in, in Connecticut, not, not in here, is the finger of the Lord pointing up to heaven. And I think that's really what they had in mind. So they, they understood, <laughs> strangely enough, they understood just as the Romans had done in the time of Augustus Caesar, they understood what the obelisk really was all about. Okay, so we finished with pyramids and obelisks. Everything you ever wanted to know and more. So now we turn to the mummies. So this is one of these primitive burials from the beginning of time, uh, 5,000 years ago. Yeah, 5,000 years ago. And it, it's now in the British Museum. So they've tried to replicate a burial pit with Ginger, that's her name because she had uh, red hair when she was first found, uh, is lying in here. The British Museum occasionally goes through and up updates what her burial goods would have, would have really been on the basis of knowledge of, of, of the way things developed in Egypt. But anyway, she's lying there ready for you. And she's a natural mummy. She's never been, she's never been treated. She was buried so close to the surface as the o older ones were that the sun had time to dry her out before she, her body could corrupt. So she, she sort of cooked, but I mean, it, it, it really, it really was, was drying her out. So that's what mummification is all about. There's nothing magical about mummification. When the Egyptians had to turn to artificial mummification, they knew what they had to do. And they had to turn to artificial mummification because of scenes like this. This is a beloved father, grand, grandfather, whatever, who was buried in his, in his nice Cedar of Lebanon sarcophagus in his tomb, but when his body was robbed, looking for the, the treasures on it, by the tomb robbers. As soon as you put a body in the ground, someone comes along. Tomb robbing is at least the second oldest profession in the world. <laughs> so you put, the, you put the body down, people take it out again, leave it thrown over against a, against a stone or whatever, and try, try to see if there's anything valuable on it. Well, when, when the, in the annual festival of the revival of the ancestors happens, People come over and see these tombs and they say, oh my goodness, that doesn't look like Uncle George anymore. So they didn't like that. They want, they want the person who dies, their loved one, to look like himself or herself as much as possible. So they had to turn to artificial means for this. And the reason was, of course, that they had built these deep shafts that the sun could not penetrate anymore in order to, for the security and the symbolism of getting the, the person buried deeper and deeper in, in the, in the uh, in, in the ground. So they defeated that, that original purpose. So they had to do something about it. In the beginning, this is a head in the Cairo Museum, they, they waited till the flesh uh, was off the, the body, that the, the, the skull was decarnated, is the proper term. And then they, they washed the head, and they covered it in plaster, and molded, modeled, 
the features of a human being in it. It didn't have to be a portrait, but it just had to, had to look like a human being. And uh, heads are very important in a very early period. Uh, in, 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 in Israel, or what is Israel now, it was Canaan at the time and later became Philistine and uh, Philistia and then, and then Israel. But in that area, they were people who traced their ancestors back to the beginning of time. And so they wanted the head of the clan to be buried close to them. So sometimes they put him in the basement of the house and sometimes they put him in a nearby cemetery. But they paid special attention to the head. Once all the flesh was rotted off the, if I may say so, off, uh, off the body, why then they went in and they probably, in most cases, swept all the bones off on the side to make a new place for, for, for laying a, a new body. But they kept the head. And they treated it in this way because that is the thing that you recognize people by. That's what you see first. And you, they, they can hear, and they can smell, and they can talk, and they can see. So this, this is the symbol for the, for the totality of your dead ancestor. Things like this. This comes from Jericho, also in what's now Israel, uh, from 7,000 years ago, very, very early. And it has nothing to do or genetically, with the Egyptian propensity for mummification. Mummification is practiced in many, 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 many places in the world. And so it's the human brain again. You're all basically human, no matter what we think about superiority and inferiority. We're all basically humans. We're all created equal. So they also made special preparations for the eyes by putting in these, these, these little uh, pieces of, uh, of, of shell or of quartz or whatever. Uh, on, over the form that they had, that they had molded and, and put this pseudo skin over. George Reisner from the uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts was excavating at Giza, and he started finding little chips and chunks of plaster, which didn't make any sense to him. Uh, some of his predecessors, most likely Petrie, would have just thrown them away. But Reisner was sort of concerned, and so he, he, he saved them, put them in a pile. He uh, collected a lot of them, and then he called to the villagers and said, send down some of your sons who are clever with puzzles and things like that and help me put them together. And so they did, and he discovered that he had a whole case for a body. So he found a whole series. So the Egyptians were trying to, to let the deceased go through life looking as much as, uh, as possible as human. Now we come to the time of completely successful artificial um, mummification. This is the father of Ramses II, the pathetic guy we saw in the very beginning. This is the most perfect uh, of, of the royal mummies. And they have learned completely how to do it. You've got to get all the fluid out of the body. As soon as they die, you cut open the abdomen. You take out all the soft organs that are in there, which are going to be the first ones to corrupt. You uh, put, take them out, and then you pack the body with salt, a thing called uh, natron. And then you also pack the inner organs with natron as well. You, if you take the heart out, you dry it and you put it back, or, uh, or, or not. Uh, you can also put a, a substitute, a scarab, uh, that, that has the heart spell from the, from the Book of the Dead. And they, they also don't, they don't understand the brain at all. Here's this mushy thing up there. It doesn't seem to have any function except maybe to make the, the, the head hold its form after death. So either they do this thing, which is the favorite, of all of all the kids. They put this rod up the nose and they catch the fragments of the brain and break the, the septum and pull it down. Oh yeah, that's great. Kids love mummies. They're really ghoulish. Or, or they, I mean, when, when we had to take the mummy room down at University of Pennsylvania, we had to put a case out in the hall because the school groups coming through were so upset that they couldn't see a mummy while we were re re renovating them. Or they leave it in, in the body. So what you do then, once you dry out, these are, these are the little bundles that have all the inner organs uh, dried out and the body dried out, you then put it back in the cavity because you've got to go to the next world with everything except the brain, which they didn't understand. <laughs> I, I've had students like that. <laughs> so this, this is the alternative. This is the alternative where, where we have these so-called canopic jars, which is also another jargon word. It has nothing to do with... with, with uh, with their, what the Egyptians call them. And so they, they put the individual organs inside each of these four jars after they're dried. Then the mortician comes and sets in the eyes and gives her a perm and that kind of stuff. And so Aunt Lulu here would have been quite recognizable to her family. They would have been very happy when they, when they took her to, her to her grave. Now we, of course, in the 20th century, are concerned about Egyptian health. What did they die of? How old were, were they when they died? 
So in the 1970s, we started a project that started in, in Manchester in England. We started a project to autopsy mummies. We don't do that anymore, and, I, and you'll see why as we go along, because it leaves shreds, it shreds the body which the Egyptians were uh, interested in preserving, and that kind of violates the, our, our, our contract with the, with the Egyptians. So this is a mummy uh, that came from the University of Pennsylvania Museum. It went to Detroit, where they had specialists who were, who were both uh, uh, paleopathologists and who were um, Egyptologists as well. And the first thing they had to do is to dig through the layers of linen and the uh, asphalt, the bitumen, which was used to impregnate it and hold it together as making a, a, a kind of an impregnable case. They had to get down there. And then they could do really neat things. They, they pulled out the, uh, the heart and the trachea and associated vessels here. And they found that they could treat them like uh, histological specimens. You're lying on the table. The doctor takes a sample of, of whatever uh, you think might be uh, uh, infected with cancer or so forth. You get it rushed to the, uh, to the, to the, to the room where they can uh, examine it. And then they dry it out and um, uh, preserve it in, in, uh, in uh, wax. And they can make thin slices of it. Well, the Egyptians uh, didn't do that. But the modern people before the invention of x-ray, this is, this is uh, Run Dr. Röntgen's uh, uh, invention, uh, Röntgenology, uh, in which the, as soon as it was discovered for medical purposes, everybody rushed to x-ray their mummies so they could see what was going on inside without having to destroy them, which is a good step forward. So this is a person lying on his back, or her back, and there is the, the bitumen, which was poured in to substitute for the brain. They wanted to put something in there to, to, so, so they would continue to function. You can see his eye socket, his nose, his mouth and chin, and so forth. When I first went to, to the University of Chicago, I rushed down to the Field Museum in Chicago in order to see the great mummy display that they had at the time, showing the mummies standing up wrapped and the x-rays beside them. Now we come to the 20, at least, at least the, now the 21st century, but the late 20th century, and we are utilizing CAT scans. That's even better. You don't, you don't have to break up the coffee. You don't have to do anything. It's perfectly preserved. There's no danger. So we took the mummies from the Oriental Institute Museum across the street to the University, of Penn, or to the University uh, uh, Hospital and ran them through the CAT scans. Now, we did this at night because that's when the CAT scan machining is not in, in service. And also, it wasn't thought to be a good idea that the people who are getting CAT scans the next day should know that a dead body had been in there. <laughs> But of course, everything was sterilized before, before, before the living person went into it. But that meant that we could then see, just as you can with, with, with a living specimen, we, we can see various cuts. There are the leg bones, there's the spine, there are some of the bundles. So we don't have to destroy these, these wretched things anymore. Now, sometimes that didn't work. This is a poor guy, or girl, I don't know which, uh, who was buried at the site of Abydos in a nice wooden coffin, but the termites found her and it. And so the termites ate all the leather-like flesh off her, and they ate a good share of the, of, of the wood that was, that was there as well. So the Egyptians, again, we don't like this. So then they put masks and forms over the body so it would look more human. This is Tutankhamun, of course, in gold. This is a lady from the, from the artisan's village at General Medina in the New Kingdom who has a wooden coffin, but uh, making, making her body, which is inside it, look more, more like a human being, an anthropomorphic coffin. Tutankhamun has this headpiece because, of course, the head is the most important thing that they're thinking about. And then uh, uh, private people, this is from the, from, from the late Greek or even the Byzantine period uh, uh, in Egypt, could make it out of something called cartonnage, which is uh, papier mache, paper mache. So they had layers and layers of plaster and either papyrus or linen that they, they molded into a form. And it doesn't look like anybody. I mean, it looks human, that's all. And if you wanted to, to be specific, you could even write the name of the person that you intended on, on, on the mask. Then the Romans had this, these wonderful things with these plaster heads. They, the, the, the Romans bury people as though they're on a couch and they're lying down. But, but every now and then, they show us one where the head is coming up saying, where am I? What's going on? And so. The, this very realistic uh, representation of a Roman woman with in, inlaid glass eyes and showing her perm and so forth is uh, what we have. And then the, the, the most well-known of these things are the so-called uh, Fayum portraits from the Roman period, 
uh, and we get the representations of the dead person wrapped into, that's what's happened here, the thieves have come in and they've, they've ripped all the wrappings away, but this should have been in place of the, the, the head or, or the face of, of the person who was buried here. Then they have backup insurance. So they make statues of the deceased to put, just for, just for burial, to put in the tomb. And they put them in a chamber which is inaccessible from the outside, so they build them in. They don't want people who hate this man, or who might hate this man, to be able to go and smash up his body and, and, and uh, hack out all of his inscriptions and thereby deprive him completely of a chance for afterlife. So they hide these inside a special chamber called the serdab, which really, really means closet or, uh, or storage uh, area. And some of them look very real realistic. They, they go out of their way. When, when the uh, uh, Arab workmen working, at, again, with the French at the end of the 19th century came upon this piece, it was lying face up, and they said, oh my god, it looks like our mayor. So that, that means Sheikh al -Bellet. His name is Sheikh al -Bellet, although he has a real name, and he's on display in the Cairo Museum. Then they, 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 they go one step further. They make a little tiny mummy. These, these are maybe 10 inches, maybe 8 inches. It, it varies according to time. They make a little, a little mummy. They write the name of the person on it. They uh, put the, the, the uh, shuabti, these are shuabtis, or ushabtis, or shebtis. The Egyptians had different ways of, of ex, uh, explaining what they were. And so it, it was found wrapped up in a, in a piece of linen. Then they put the coffin lid on top, so there you are. You have another body substitute. Well, this, this became a real racket. Uh, down in the late period, so that means the first millennium, so for several hundred years, the Egyptians buried 400 shuabtis with the, with the person. Started out with a single one, all wrapped up like that in the coffin. Now they, now they, make, they make 400 of them to give you a better chance. So these are little agricultural tools which these guys have. If you'd look on the back of it, you'd find a little sand basket. So they're supposed to do the work that would be required of the dead person in the afterworld. So they, they make it possible for the dead person just to enjoy the afterlife and sit back and send his shuabis out to do it. And the inscriptions, of course, name them and also say some of the things that they're supposed to do, the kind of mindless things that bureaucracies like to do. It's, you, if, if anyone shall say, take sand from the west and bring it to the east, or take sand from the east and take it to the west, you will speak up and say, I will do it. So these were the mindless jobs which, uh, which, which they were expected to do. Now, 400 is not an arbitrary figure. 400 is one shawabti for every day of the year, 365 days. They didn't bother with the fourth. And uh, then also, for every... For every um, 10 shuamtis, you have a supervisor. So you take your supervisor with you as well to, to, to the culture of, of 10 workmen. They love this stuff. Now, this is an actual burial found at Dalmadina, the workman's village. Uh, how are we doing? OK, we're getting close. And this, this is the whole thing. It's from the 18th dynasty. The, the tomb wasn't uh, stone cut anymore. It was just a hole in the ground until, until the 19th and 20th dynasties. So there's, there's the dead person inside the sarcophagus that looks like him. There's his favorite musical instrument, the lyre that he's taking with him. There are baskets and baskets of, of goodies and uh, 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 pottery full of, full of wine and water and so forth. There's his little footstool. There's his bed and so forth. They, they can take the things from this life, actually, and put it in the tomb. Or they can make a substitute. They can make something cheap and, uh, because you want to keep the real thing at home and use it again and put something like it in, in, the, in, the, in the tomb. So they can have not only the harp, but the harpist sing for them throughout all of eternity just by representing it. And you notice that he's actually blind. So in, 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 the, in the musical tradition that if you lose a sight or some other, some other uh, sense, you'll be able to, to emphasize a, uh, another activity even more. So that, that's, uh, they were not blinded, but they were born blind. And so sometimes in the text above, you get the, uh, the actual song that the harper is singing. But here it's just talking about the people. Here they could take some of their actual clothing with them to the tomb. And this is not the clothing which they show us in their representations. So remember, the elite of Egypt, that is the pharaoh and his, his agents and his, and his sons and daughters and so forth, they were the ones for whom Egypt worked. 
they were the ones who had education, they were the ones who had money, they, they could pursue this, this, this and, and, and carry it to the fullest. That the, the uh, uh, ancient Egyptians, who were largely agricultural peasants, we call them, uh, didn't have access to, the, to these things. But they must, have had, they must have felt the same way about their bodies because of the little pits that we found in the few little, little burial goods which are around them. But we're basically talking about how the elite organized themselves, and uh, this gives us only one very thin layer of uh, what was actually going on in the whole society. They, again, can draw washermen who are washing their clothes so they can have fresh, clean clothes in the next world. They can take these little servant statues carrying jars of beer on their head, balancing that while carrying a duck. And they, they don't have to sacrifice their serv servants anymore. And they can make these little uh, representations of slitting the throat of, of a beef so that you can have everyday fresh meat on your altar. There's the blood streaming out and the guy with a knife. And here in the tombs they show you, having cut up the meat, how you dry it, hang it up, and preserve it. You can have fishermen, who are providing you with fish forever. You can take your boat with you to the afterworld. This is a little model boat from the tomb of Tutankhamun that he, he could take with him to the afterworld. Or you can take your 120-foot Cedar of Lebanon sailing ship as well, if you were pharaoh. And uh, these are called sun ships, but I don't think that's really what they are. And so you can go visit that in the Cairo Museum, or not in the Cairo Museum, in, in, in the boat museum at, at Giza. You can take a papyrus roll called the Book of the Dead, and you can represent yourself, there he is, in the solar bark with the baboon who represents the rising sun, making an offering before the sun god as he rises. You, you put yourself in the bark, and you get to join the sun as he goes through the sky every day. The, the Romans and Greeks use chariots. The Egyptians use, use ships for this purpose. And this is a beautifully done uh, 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 cursive hieroglyphic uh, monument. They, the, the owner of the tomb, was, whose name is in a scrawl up here, he goes into the shop, says, I like that. How much is it? Oh, I can afford it. Okay, we'll do it on the payment plan, whatever. And, and so, so then he takes it with him, and then they personalize it for him. And the man who personalized it for him hardly knew how to write. The, these were the professional scribes down here, and then we, we like it when they put his name in there anyway. This is the boat building spell from the uh, uh, Book of the Dead. If you don't have your boat with you, you just... Draw a picture of the spell, put it in, the, in your tomb, and you're all right. So up above are these, these columns which tell you the, the names of all the pieces which are down here. And I can name a few because I'm not a sailor. This is the mooring post. That's the mallet for driving in the mooring post. This is the rope for mooring to the land. These are various parts of the ship. There, there are, are the, uh, the paddles. Here's the steering oar back there. They even give you the pilot and the, the sail and the waters that you're going to go on. So that's all you need. That's all you need. And sometimes they, they make little, little models, as, as we'll see uh, in, in the lecture coming up on Sunday. So now, what happens? In the Old Kingdom, you bring the offerings into the offering chambers. Nobody enters the burial, no one enters the burial, but the, the, the mastabas are open so that family members can come in on this annual festival and, and give fresh food to their, to their um, relatives. And the mortuary priests are responsible every day for supplying meat and vegetables and whatever water to, to go on, on, the, on the altars as well. They put it down, leave it for 10 minutes, take it to another tomb, put it down, leave it for 10 minutes. It, it circulates. I mean, spirits don't eat much. And, 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 and when, when you're finished, you don't see little mouse nibbles around the edge. So at the end of the day, as part of their payment, because they're, they're not really producing anything, uh, you get to take that home to help feed your family. So they're very practical. So what this is, the burial shaft is going down here. This is the offering table. It's in the, word, the shape of a hieroglyphic word for to offer. This is a false door. The, there's the, 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 the wooden uh, part of it. Of course, you bang your head on it if, if you try to get through it. But through magic, those people who are initiated, um, uh, think about Star Trek. Beam me aboard, Scotty, this kind of stuff. Because the, the dead person, the spirit, is able to come up behind, come through this door, and partake of the offerings which are, which are put out here. But God help you if you try to follow them back in. And you never see them. You never see them, I think, unless you've been drinking too much. <laughs> this is an, another very a nice example of that, uh, showing a man actually modeled as though coming out from this, the, this niche. And here's the offering uh, slab again. So you open the door, and he comes out. He seems to come out and, and take advantage of his offerings before they're moved off to another tomb. And my favorite of all is this little guy in a tiny mastaba, published by uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. You can go online and see it. 
Uh, he's come up into the tomb. I, I let only five people in here at a time because it's just too tight and we'll, we'll do damage otherwise. He, he seemed to have come up from the tomb shaft. He flops his arms out here on top and says, lay it right here, baby. And then it, it's like, a, it's, it's like a, a dumbwaiter. He's going to come up and then we expect him to go back down again so we can enjoy it. All right? So they had these various ideas about uh, how this worked. In the New Kingdom, these are the very last slides, in the New Kingdom now, you get representations of the dead man sitting beside, it looks like they're behind, but they're not, that's just so you can, you can see the whole body of both of them. There, there, there's, there's a dead man, there are the two women behind, one of which is his wife, the other one is her mother, so the in-law got along well. And this is the, the goddess of the tree, who is... Uh, uh, presenting water and figs from the fig tree for them. At the same time as these little human-headed birds, they look like harpies, but we call them baas in, in Egyptology. They're drinking water, and so the baas are cupping their, their hands so that they can drink water from the pool as well. You've got to appear with your spirit and with your body in order to go successfully to the afterworld. So the, every, every day, the ba has to come down, land on the coffin, unite with it, this is a lovely example from Tutankhamun. He has two baths, but that's a different lecture. These are uh, supervisor shuapti. Remember I said for every 10 workers there was a supervisor? Well, see, these guys have a, have a different clothes. And this one has got the ba plastered on him. So the ba's never going to be separated from him. Now, this is what the Egyptians imagined was actually happening in, in, the, in, in the New Kingdom. So up here is the, the above ground level where oxen are dragging in uh, various things, and these are the pile of offerings. This is the mourning woman. This is the uh, mummified deceased with the opening of the mouth being performed by a priest. Here is the entrance into his tomb. <coughs> and then a shaft going down to where the burial is actually lying. So we've seen that represented in architecturally. But there's the little ba, shuttling back and forth, going down, taking from, the, from what's being offered up here and taking it down to the dead guy lying there stiff as a board. I mean, the, the old Boris Karloff mummy coming out and staggering, forget that. Uh, it's impossible. So he's, he's facilitating the, 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 the reunion. And I, I just added this little part over here. It's from the same thing, but uh, 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 a different, different uh, view of it. Here is the little bar which I have over here. And now you can see what is missing here, that the dead man is rising out of the tomb in conjunction with the sun. The sun is rising, and he's coming out of the tomb. And the Egyptians show action by not showing the whole body. They're showing us that, that this is a work in progress, that as, as he progresses out, you're going to see the whole body, but you don't see it here. And this is from the book, which we know as the Book of the Dead, which is called The Book of Going Forth by Day with the Sun. So that's really what it's called. So here's the little man holding his ba so it can't get away. And finally, here is a representation. It's the same man in two phases. He enters his tomb. And he comes out of the tomb accompanied by his ba. In reality, his body doesn't come out, but they show it that, that way, and only the ba comes out. So I know this is very complicated, but uh, I hope that it helps you realize that the Egyptians are human after all. Thank you very much.